Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to our webinar and thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a secondary supervisor training session. We will be covering enabling learning, utilizing available knowledge resource. Uh, again, this is supervisor session two. We covered session one this morning and now this afternoon we will be covering session two. So thank you all of you who joined us again for this webinar. And welcome to all of you who have not joined us again but are here. Um, and I guess we will begin. We will be covering Mega a Gold, Mega Gold 1, Mega Gold 2, I mean Mega Gold 1, Mega Gold 3, and 5. Uh, moving on to the moderators for today. I guess, sorry, I didn't do a sound check because I heard someone just said you can't hear me. So once you are in WebEx, you will have to log in to the audio, connect to the audio to hear us. Um, there is a hand icon on the right side of your screen. If you can locate it, please. And it should be just below your name. Uh, please click on the hand icon if you can hear my voice, giving you a minute to locate. Excellent. We are expecting over 600 people in this webinar today. So I'm going to give it a start and we'll wait for the other. I mean, we will not wait for the others to join. Uh, we will just go ahead and they can join in the background. OK, lots of hands going up. Moving on to the moderators quickly. Myself, Sarish, along with my colleagues, Minerva, Nikos, Medini, and Nasir. We're in the background to answer any questions or if you face any trouble, just feel free to shoot that over to us. Um, our trainer for today is Danai. Uh, you already know who is a teacher educator, a content developer, and an author. She delivered successful training workshops earlier in Saudi Arabia as well and also co-authored the Saudi edition. Um, Danai usually refers to a handout during the session, so this session also had a, has a handout. It only has one handout. Dropping the link to the handout in the chat box now. And my colleague Minerva has already dropped it, so it's the same thing as well. Please don't be confused. Uh, same link, just sending it to you over again in case you missed the first one. This is the other one. This is for session two. This is the session that I will be covering today. Um, I just want to thank Denai for her time and being with us today for session two for secondary supervisor. Thanks, Denai. Thank you. Uh, moving on to housekeeping really quickly before I pass on. If uh, you are in the webinar, you will have to connect to the audio, and I've just dropped the link how you can connect the audio. Uh, if you are facing any connectivity issues with the audio, we recommend use your phone to dial in. Although we checked, you can hear me, so we're probably sorted there. We also recommend you close down any high networking apps such as Netflix, YouTube, gaming platform, because this is going to affect the bandwidth of your webinar. Um, I have received uh, queries about the certificate of participation during the beginning of the webinar. Um, you will receive the certificate of participation after November 19th. Uh, for all elementary, intermediate, secondary, although this might take further a week because uh, we have received registrants who have used their colleagues' email to log in. So we need to sort all of that out uh, and make sure you get your certificate. You will receive a certificate for every session that you've attended. Um, there is an opportunity for Q&A towards the end of the session, so we ask uh, Benai a couple of questions after an hour, and uh, we understand that you don't have to stay for those Q&A because you need to go back. So it's okay, you can log it off after one hour, and those of you who want to stay can stay back, ask us any questions if you have anything for deny, and we will cover this as we go along. And uh, quickly, you must have noticed you are muted, you won't be able to unmute yourself. And you can only see your name on the right side of the screen. Um, you're not in a hidden list, but uh, there are 400 people who are with you today. You will not be able to see them due to GDPR purpose. And also, you will not be able to see the comments that your colleagues have put in the chat box, again, because of GDPR purposes. Uh, you will then I usually read them out, so don't worry about this. She will read out the comments as they come in. Um, and the Q&A box is related, located on the right side of your screen. Oops, sorry. On the right side of your screen and the chat box, Denai is going to read out from the chat box. So make sure you put your comments for the presenter in the chat box. The Q&A box is basically just for any questions that you want us to pick up after the session. 
Um, if you want us to ask Sanai any question or anything related to the session, put them in the Q&A box. Or if you're having problems with audio, put it in the Q&A box. Any other general questions you can put on. But if you want to interact with the presenter, please use the chat box. These are both located on the right side of your screen, and it's enabled for everyone. So if you click on it, you will be able to see this. And I guess uh, that's it from my end. I'm now going to hand over to Denai so that we can give this a start. Thanks, Denai, and thank you, everyone. You muted. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Okay, as Sue said, we're going to be talking about uh, utilizing available knowledge resources in the classroom and online. Uh, okay, sorry. Now, before we actually go on to that, all right, when we talk about a classroom or online, basically what's the first thing that comes to mind? What makes a class? Internet distance, yes. But what makes a class? What is required for a learning context? Okay, a platform if it's online. But can a platform do things on its own? Or no? Okay. So, students, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can we focus on students first? Students and teacher. The screen is not the boss, as somebody said, but the screen is what we use for focus. Okay? Um, We'll carry on with that. Okay, so once again, for those of you who were here in the previous session, um, those of you who were not here in the previous session, maybe you could uh, have a look at the handout of the previous session. Reflecting on learners, how much do we know about them? How much do we know about each individual learner? Learning styles, multiple intelligences, personality, cognition, skills, talents, working with others. Are they good at working with others? Collaborative learning? Are they competitive? Sharing with others? Attitude to mistakes? These are random sort of factors that are thrown together. What I would like to suggest is that you help your teachers put together a simple questionnaire, very practical, for students to fill in about themselves, or a questionnaire for students to interview each other, make notes and hand in, or report on each other. <coughs> Sorry. Um, from the teacher's point of view, create a class file on your computer, and store copies of all completed questionnaires. <clears throat> the reason for that being is that this is a, these are sort of live documents, they're interactive documents. As you find out more about them, you can add things. And you don't have to add about every single student every time. But if something, if you find out, for example, that somebody has um, traveled to a couple of places, Make a note of it because it might come in handy in a future lesson. <coughs> Excuse me. It's important to find out about free time activities, favorite videos, films, favorite books, story, place, food, drink, sweet, color, app, store, whatever else you can imagine. Interest, Space, technology, fashion, travel, culture, languages, literature, Formula One, other motor racing, inventions, robotics, gaming, environment, research, aeronautics, 
uh, chemistry, whatever you can think of, okay? And they can just pick the things that they're interested in. And also, always remember to include other dot dot so they can add things. Again, this is very, very important to help us address them in such a way so that we can involve them, we can engage them, and we can carry on with what we need to do. Okay, um, I'd like to make a comment here um, about that the question that I, I didn't want to answer at the end of the first session about SMART. Typically, it's not the kind of analysis that we follow. Um, it's uh, we we talk about objectives, learning outcomes, and in the context of language teaching, learning, teaching theory, and so on. Uh, we really talk about the process that can be followed and the strategies that need to be developed in order to obtain those aims. SMART is a kind of analysis that requires a fair bit of time. Um, if you want to, you could, I suppose, apply it to a project or particularly if you want to collect data and so on. It is used in higher education management and all that, but it's not typically the kind of breakdown that we use in this field, I don't think. Um, unless, again, we're talking about higher education projects and so on. Um, okay, as far as I know. Okay. Um, now, there were a couple of requests again about rules and translation and traditional teaching and so on. And what I would like to zero in on and what is in every teacher's uh, mind um, are mistakes. Mistakes and how the mistakes are going to affect your students' uh, grades and assessment, in other words, in the final exam. Um, should that basically guide the way we approach everything? Yes, knowing your students is a fundamental step in teaching. Yes, as far as I know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, it's impossible to help people learn, which I will be stressing instead of teaching, help people learn if we don't know them if we don't know what they can do. Speaking of mistakes and, and learner abilities, yes, absolutely, portfolio can be helpful. Um, okay, we, we use portfolios also as a means of assessment. Now, in assessment, uh, this material has been designed for ongoing assessment uh, and to formative assessment to help uh, teachers, learners see, find out how much they have learned, what the learning outcomes are, what else needs to be done, plan accordingly, and carry on, which is sensible, practical, and realistic. <clears throat> okay, and then you could have your final test if you want, but it's a different kind of assessment. You can't rely on just the final test. If you rely on the final test only, mistakes are going to rule the day. And then it's going to be impossible for you to prevent teachers from um, resorting to traditional uh, techniques and, and translations and rules and so on. Um, need I say anything about people who can uh, recite rules, but can't really implement them, can't speak, can't put words together effectively to write a short email or write a re short report, something like that. Uh, we have a lot of evidence 
Having said that, we also have evidence that if somebody wants to learn, they will learn despite the method. But our job is to try and address the need as they uh, basically demonstrate themselves on an ongoing basis. And at this point, in our time. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so are mistakes tolerated in the L2 classroom learning context? Do teachers tolerate mistakes? Well, what is your experience as supervisors? Hello? They do tolerate mistakes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, use students' mistakes to build up a lesson. Um, now, in terms of, okay, let me move on in that case. To basic interaction patterns. Um, some of you have seen this before more than once, but for those who haven't, uh, allow me to go through them, please. Yes, we must tolerate mistakes to give them a chance to learn. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we we should allow it um, so we can plan accordingly. The thing is, if we don't allow students to take risks in trying to use what they're learning, then how will they ever develop? And as we learn, we make mistakes and learn from our mistakes and so on and so forth. So uh, really doing away with that, eliminating that, uh, is not realistic. Uh, especially if we want, again, to address young adults who are about to start studies, work, and so on, who are in touch and in contact with the real world, well, the same would go for young learners because all of the uh, learners now, be it young, uh, young adolescents, older adolescents, and so on. Uh, <coughs> yes, uh, communication is 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 the requirement. Okay, even if we have broadened the approach to include other things because we don't want to be dogmatic. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, teacher to students, okay, this is the traditional um, interaction where a single teacher addresses the whole class, yes, the student. Uh, typically in a face-to-face -face class we use it to present new language, give instructions, uh, to talk, report back from class, give feedback to the class and anything else you can think of. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, I'll go back to mistakes in a minute. Um, online, it's not difficult, is it? I mean, whether you show yourself or not, you are present through audio, you address all your learners. Student to student in open pairs. Okay, there is a difference between open and closed pairs, yeah? Okay, uh, in open pairs, if you are in the classroom, you're asking uh, Emma to talk to Sahar, uh, and everyone else can listen. You don't have to nominate if you're in the classroom. You can point to people and get them to practice, ask and answer, whatever you're doing, whatever you want them to practice. If you're online, you need to nominate. Yeah? So it's done across class again, but across virtual class. Student to student in closed pairs is what we use 
to optimize the time available in class in order to give people as many opportunities as possible to speak, to do things, okay, to practice, but to speak. Okay, and this means that people work together in pairs. Everybody works together at the same time. You train them not to shout. They don't need to shout because if they're working together in pairs, they just simply don't need to shout. They can hear each other. So that's the one thing to bear in mind. If you are online and you have functions that allow you to send students in pairs or teams into chat rooms, that's great because then you'll be able to listen in. They know you're listening in and that will eventually, they'll know that you want them to speak English to each other. They will speak English to each other because they know you will be able to listen in. And you do the listening in discreetly so as not to interrupt them, unless, of course, you want to help with something or clarify something or tell them something. In class, face-to-face, -face, uh, examples of the sorts of things we can do with closed pairs, exchanging, sharing information, um, interviews, role plays, lead-in activities, brainstorming, working out possible answers, um, doing checking exercises, working together, and the teacher monitors. So if you're the teacher, you can move around if you're in class. If you're online, you can listen in. Are you all still there? <laughs> um, yes and no, okay, flipped, yes and no. Yes, okay, great, thank you, <laughs> I was wondering. Okay, students to students in groups, close. Again, yes, I know, has only one room. This is what everybody tells me, that in, in uh, Microsoft Teams, you've only got one room. Thank you for being here. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll, I'll make some suggestions there. Uh, okay. But in class, if you are in class and after all this, after everything that's happening, if you are in class, basically what you do with closed pairs, you can do with closed groups, which is the best way of working, quite honestly. And yes, this is a good mode to use when you're doing flipped class and so on. Or create channels. Yes, yes, yes. I understand that people resort to all sorts of things. In some platforms, you have a function. Um, yes, I know. I, I, um, I know we did this uh, last week. As I said earlier this morning in the morning session, Inevitably, there will be some overlap between intermediate and uh, secondary. So I'm sorry about this, but I need to go through people who have just joined. Um, okay, student to students, this is totally flipped yet. You exchange roles, you hand over to a student or to students, okay, to maybe present something. Um, Okay, to uh, conduct an activity in class, a demonstration, pair group presentation. You're welcome. I'm just explaining why I'm repeating things, sorry. Okay, online, breakout room, flipped roles, yeah? When we talk about flipped class, just to make it clear, what, what, um, um, what I take really as, a, as, as the rule is that we flip roles, in other words, we hand over to students. We ask students to do what we might have done in class. And that, I think, is what we need to bear in mind. In other words, how we can keep our students active. Uh, okay. Uh, how we can, we can involve them. How we can keep them engaged. And how we can make the most of what they know, 
which is often way beyond the level of what you're doing, maybe in fluency. Maybe they need to develop more in writing. There, in, in written uh, work, uh, there is reason to be concerned about uh, grammatical accuracy, for example, but not in the way of lecturing again. Um, okay, so knowledge, again, when we're talking about young adults or the adolescents, young adults, we are talking about people who know things, and especially nowadays, I can't stress this enough, uh, our learners are in touch with the world, are in touch with things that are happening. Yes, some more than others, I understand that. Uh, it depends on, on social circumstances as well. It depends on a number of different things. It depends on their context. Uh, <clears throat> but if you look at the learner factors from the first uh, session, <clears throat> you'll be able to think of that. Um, but knowledge, they have general knowledge, specialized knowledge, topic related, experience, day to day, uh, school subjects, a different area of interest. They, they might be knowledgeable in art, films, sports, uh, personal, uh, issues, language and language skills, health, educational context, family, culture, skills, other, you name it. And they're very often updated when it's, when, when it's about, you know, which apps, um, any technological advances. Um, yes, find a link to their prior knowledge. But what I'm trying to say is that because we don't know exactly what they might have learned, read, and so on, what we do is we try to always begin with the learners. We address questions that they can think about, brainstorm, pool knowledge. So we focus on the learners, we tap, we access knowledge sources through images, questions, statements, other tasks that are open. Pairs or groups pool knowledge. They put everything they know together. As long as we allow thinking time, processing time, and this doesn't have to be very long. Um, and then it's feedback time. Feedback doesn't need to be given by the teacher only. It's feedback time is the time when the pairs and groups report in class as well. One of the things to do when you ask them, for example, to think about uh, uh, think about uh, uh, recent advances in the in in, in the motor industry in, in in cars, for example, uh, get them to make notes. Okay, make a note of what they thought. You ask them, for example, to uh, brainstorm on the the vocabulary or the ideas they expect to find in something that they're going to read or something that they're going to listen to, ask them to make notes. The reason for that being so that the first thing you do after that is ask them to read and compare. Compare with their expectations. Compare with um, their expectations in terms of the content, in terms of the language, and so on. So allowing thinking time, processing time, is key. So once again, things that we do, we find out, we activate, we raise expectations, we elicit, we build up, Think, pair, and share. Thank you. Yes, think, pair, and share. Collaborate. We hand over. Flip. We generate. Update. Reward. Withhold. Flip. Involve. Encourage. And a lot more. What do I mean by withhold? Oops. Um. It's not, no, it's not the, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> it's not the, the, the one. Um, 
is making notes and their first language acceptable. It does um, only if it's absolutely necessary. No, uh, it's better if you teach them to make notes in English. I'll tell you why when we hit uh, um, an example for writing. Okay, for example here, what will they think of next? Okay, get them to think about people, language, transportation, traffic, all of these areas. Add more areas if you, if you like. Um, ask them to choose three that they're interested in, that they've read something on, um, that they would like to mention something new that they've read about or seen about. They will have seen things on the web, I'm sure. Um, then you get them to look at what is in, in the text. Uh, another um, unit that I, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't got on transparency now is the world of TV. That's unit four. I don't know if any of you have noticed it. Uh, basically, what it what you have there are little texts. Okay, see, think, and wonder. Yes, what you have are little texts that give you the plot, the characters, and the plot of of a film, but it doesn't give you the name of the film. So they have to read the the little uh, summary with the plot and the characters, and they try to identify the film or read it, whatever it might be. This is what I mean by withhold. Don't give them everything. Withhold things so you can make them think, you can make them predict, okay? You can, you can teach them how to use different clues in order to do that, yes. You can you can get them thinking and keep them thinking because as long as they're thinking and they're thinking critically and using their minds and justifying things, then you will have them there and they will be interested and they will be involved. Okay. Um, wow. <laughs> I've been going too long. <laughs> okay. All right. This is from um, five, I believe. Mega call five. It's just different bits and pieces. Um, I'm going to. Okay. Again, I would like to repeat what I mentioned earlier this morning. This, the grammar, and listen and discuss are connected. Uh, do remind your teachers to make the connection. Okay? Have a look at the text. Identify all the examples. Okay? Try and figure out why that particular form is being used. What is being used? Okay, for example, the reason in, in that uh, in what we looked at in the first hour in advertising, the reason that one of the language points is comparative superlatives is because that's frequent in advertising and advertising is based on that because you want to say what's best, what is better than the rest of the product and so on. So you will find that the context in the book support the meaning of the grammar, which is exactly what we're interested in, the concept, okay? Rather than spending time, wasting time, memorizing rules, memorizing meta language, okay? We help them discover it. You can actually begin your grammar lesson through this and get them to think about the form and why it's being used what purpose does it serve there through specific questions and then go to exercises that require use of the form and so on. Okay, conversation. I think it's come to my <laughs> attention that 
people tend to sort of leave out things like pair work, your turn, which allows students to uh, personalize, use the language, practice any sort of functions and so on, practice appropriacy here, which is an issue as well. Um, Role play, yes, absolutely, role play. Um, those are very important practice um, opportunities. Okay. Um, I'm afraid we can't go through everything sort of in great detail. And look at this, an out of, the, of this world vacation. You could actually just put this on the on on your screen and out of the of this world vacation and and get them to brainstorm and think of possible content for what they're going to read, what kind of vacation, what possible destinations, why do they think that, and so on and so forth. Um, this is the International Space Station. Um, I'm just throwing in examples. Um, there are all kinds of developments now with the International Space Station as to how long it's going to last, what needs to be reconstructed, and so on. You absolutely let them use the Internet, okay? Uh, use the Internet to find information, okay? So look at all the opportunities you have in relation with your learners. doesn't have to be long. You want to save time, then on a rotating basis, flip, I'll ask some of the students, or if you have teams, even better, ask different teams to research and present, just very briefly in class. Research, find one or two uh, images, present, okay? And this way, you are giving them the opportunity to do that. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, what you have in, in five is also speaking, specifically speaking, uh, that follows on from your reading. Okay. This will give you a lot of opportunities about assigning things, researching, discussing, but you can begin, if you like, in class, following these guidelines, following guidelines in the teacher's guide. Make notes. Now, making notes is a big thing. Why? Because note note taking um, is going to be a very useful skill for them. Uh, to especially if you ask them to think, think about things, make a note of what they thought. They only jot down keywords. What are keywords? Keywords are usually the words that carry information, so nouns, verbs, and so on. Don't let them write sentences. Don't let them write strings that are too long. If they stick a, pre a preposition in there because they want to remember it, in other words, if, if they make a note of a whole chunk, that's okay. But it is important that they don't write sentences especially if, you're, if your aim is to get them to speak. Why? Because if they write complete sentences, when time comes to report their ideas, um, when time comes to report the ideas, then they will read the sentences aloud. They won't be speaking. Uh, now, each, yes, these are components. Uh, these are sections. Uh, in the unit. Now, how do you manage this? How do teachers manage this? First of all, by not turning it into a grammar translation lesson. Secondly, by going through the teacher's guide and looking at guidelines, instructions, which they can use as they stand if they want, or adapt not in order to translate and give rules, but in order to make it more interesting for the learners, in order to involve them more. So just remember that every time you do something 
sorry, not you, I mean the teachers, every time that as teachers we do something that could be done by the learners, deprive our learners of the opportunity to do, learn, develop. Very simple. That is, okay, simply said, not simply done. I understand that, but it's a good start. So give it to your teachers as a question when they decide to do something. Could a student do this? Could students do this? Some, I'd like to also preempt some of the things that come up about mixed ability groups. Given the individual differences of learners and all the factors that you've got in the other hand, uh, there is no group of learners that is not a mixed ability learner because other abilities go into language as well. And if you take into consideration multiple intelligences as well, then there you go. Yes, absolutely. You should show them how to make notes. This is what I mean. Tell the teachers to show them how to make notes, which words to write. Tell them to only write words that will remind them of the idea, of what they discussed, of what they want to say. Okay? So, in a sense, the notes also operate as prompts. Okay? If I would say, they should look at the teacher's guide so that they know what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. Some teachers might have even better ideas than what's in the teacher's guide. Again, not grammar translation and rules and analyzing every text and reading every text aloud. Reading requires reading silently. Now, having said that, if you have auditory learners, they often feel that if they can hear themselves read, it's better. It just, it slows them down, however. Subvocalization slows people down as well. Um, on the way to becoming efficient and effective readers, uh, students should learn how to read silently so they can read faster. Because when we read, faster, we don't necessarily read every single word um, that's on, on the page. We might read diagonally. There are all kinds of techniques. We're not doing speed reading, but still. Yes, you can write some questions, show some questions on your screen, and the students read in order to answer the questions. What I would like to say again is, this bit that says after reading, don't set it after reading in class. The students, it, it's really while reading, okay? So have them look at this, if, if, or tell your, your, your teachers to have them look at this first, have the students look at this, then read in order to answer. Feedback, give the answers, point out which part gave them the answer, and so on. And then if they want to get them to play the audio, listen, uh, fine. Okay. Yes, reading is comprehension. Absolutely. Uh, so three-stage approach, pre, while, post. The post will involve speaking in most cases, but it could involve even more. Okay. Writing, All right. this as it happened, this particular unit is about Saudi Arabia Vision 2030, okay? Um, and in order to sort of use the, the language, if you... No? Sorry. Uh, it says, choose one development in the text which will have been completed by 2030. 
think about the impact the development will have on both your personal life and on society. Write your ideas in the organizer, in this one. Uh, write an essay presenting your ideas and give some examples. There is a model, yes? So you can ask them to read the model, identify which, what has been completed, what, which parts give you the impact. Uh, and then I would say get together in pairs, think about what they want to write about, Write it, look at the writing corner for focus. Okay, uh, what we're trying to do in the way we handle writing here is to cater for process writing, but also for discourse, for the genre, for the type of discourse that we want. So, this is why it is done in stages, because these stages can then be transferred to when they have to write something that is a lot less controlled, be it an essay or a paper when they study and so on and so forth. So this type of work preempts that and it does train people, makes them aware of the process that is followed. Now, the form, meaning, function will vary in the type of material is there. Yes. Um, <coughs> well, we'll go back to reading in a minute. Um, as I mentioned, I think, before or this morning, sorry, no, I can't remember. Um, the form, meaning, and function is there in order to cater for any specific items that are included in your curriculum, in the ministry cur curriculum, and might be included in your exams, in the test. Having said that, please do remind your teachers that there is a testing bank which can be used as is or adapted as, as teachers require. Um, back to the reading. Okay, you could organize, sorry, let me go back to the reading. Okay. Um, a very practical way of organizing jigsaw reading. But if you did this, you would have to email or somehow send, sorry, send through your platform. Yes, you can use a round round reading Robinson. Um, if you do this, okay, break down the, 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 uh, the text into parts. So this one could be broken down to one, two, three, four parts, okay, roughly speaking. So you have students, so you, you have groups, okay? So group, the first person in, in, in group A gets this, second person gets that, and so on and so forth. You don't have to write other questions if you don't want to. You may, um, but if you haven't got the time, you don't want to do it. I'm also suggesting it as an easy um, solution for teachers. Use the questions that are in the book and in the teacher's guide, because the teacher's guide will also give you questions or other tasks. Um, Give them everything, ask them to read their part, and answer whatever they can. So every group reads a part and answers one or two questions, whatever they're able to answer. If you want to make the parts longer, it could be one, two, three parts. And that way 
you can um, organize it in such a way so that more confident students get more or more demanding, less get less. Uh, there is no exam for all units as models for the final exam, but I, I believe you do have a final exam, don't you? Uh, if not for any other, um, if you want to use the, uh, the bank to create a, a, a final exam, just select the things that you want to use for the final exam. Don't use them as unit tests or unit quizzes. Um, yes, uh, jigsaw strategy is good for, for using uh, reading strategies. Um, simplifying the questions. How can you simplify these questions, for example? The first tourist in space paid $2 million. These are false true false questions. So your questions will be open ended, there'll be true false, there will be organizers, uh, there will be um, multiple choice. You have different types of task types. Uh, the, the way you deal with mixability, more confident, less confident students um, with, for example, reading is, as I said before, you could give the less demanding part of this to the less competent students, the students that you think would have more difficulty. Um, also, I, okay. Hi. Sorry for all the talking. I'm doing what I keep on uh, telling teachers not to do, and I'm sure you tell them too, not to speak all the time. And this is what I end up doing in these sessions. <laughs> I wish we had more time, then we could do workshops. Um, okay, the project. I think the project is important personally. I think it's better to um, reduce time from endless uh, rules and, and translation um, and organize it again, flip it. You don't do the project in class. You set it up in class and you assign teams, groups, if possible, if people live close by and they can work together or they can work together online. They don't have to be close. Um, then they can really do wonders with the project. Self-reflection, I know most people don't even look at it. This is so valuable from a self-assessment, formative viewpoint. Uh, there are specific notes in the teacher's guide, again, uh, for people to do this. If you don't want to do it in class, you think there's no time, uh, just ask your, t your students to do it um, at home, flip it. Um, okay, expansion unit, every uh, three, yes, every three units, okay. There's language review, there's another reading that's connected to the topic of the unit, is anybody out there? Uh, language plus on the additional items that appear in the unit. Uh, tools for writing, commonly confused words. Okay, so supposing, supposing somebody doesn't like this, this text. And yes, you can leave it for revision for the final exam, so it's not bad at all. Uh, they could use the text from the expansion unit. Although, yes, what you said is absolutely, it's a good idea to use the expansion unit, sorry, um, for revision. Now, again, a number of items in the expansion unit could be assigned for the students to do uh, beyond class. However, having said that, uh, may I please ask you to look at 
your handouts. I'm sure some of you, many of you have seen this before. Those of you who were in other sessions, sorry, <laughs> these are some of the things that we have to repeat. Uh, this is a summary of key aspects in managing learning. Um, also, may I suggest that you push teachers to try and use learning more than teaching. So it's not teaching the, the students, it's helping the students learn. We want to make them more independent. And quite honestly, thinking at these generation and the fact that they are technology natives and they have access to an immense amount of information, it's important for us to help them uh, filter what they read, because um, otherwise they'll end up with masses of information. So critical thinking is not theoretical, a, a luxury item here. It's really crucial. Uh, but a make or break for lessons is setting up activities. I know quite a few teachers under pressure because they're worried at that time tend to sort of go over the instructions very quickly or ask somebody to read them or not read them at all, um, give the instructions in, in, um, in L1, translate them, and get uh, learners to do whatever the task requires. Um, not a very good idea. First of all, let's remember that learners can be trained to understand a lot more language that they can produce. In fact, this is what they have done for a good part of their lives while acquiring first language. Uh, use MIME examples or demonstrate an activity with one or more confident students to make sure students know what they're being asked to do. This is for even lower levels. Now, at this level, Quite honestly, uh, the best thing you can do is read, give instructions in English, repeat and demonstrate, then invite more confident students or volunteers to demonstrate to, through one or more examples. Thank you, yes, repetition makes perfect. Um, students will benefit from being asked to read the instructions themselves if you want uh, allowed to begin with, but then get them used to, at this level, reading the instructions silently and work out what is required. You can then ask them to explain and or demonstrate, provide an example in class to check that they understand. You can also have students work together in pairs in order to do a task so they can help each other. So we want students to join um, forces, in a sense, to work together, to help each other learn. Uh, where are students supposed to learn? In class or at home? Hello? Are you there? <laughs> yes, in both places, but uh, I'm, I'm just preempting something. Um, I would say, first of all, in class. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Salma. Uh, first of all, in class, what we do, or, or, or online, uh, what we do together with the learners, helping them learn, um, is very important. We can't rely on study, study, study for the uh, uh, learners to learn. Again, this takes us back a few centuries, the grammar translation. Okay? This is not about, this is not an academic pursuit where we study about the language. Again, we need to learn the language and develop the ability to use it in both written and spoken discourse, any way that's needed in order to communicate. Um, also, 
Let's not forget that being able to understand and follow instructions is a very useful function in the educational as well as the social and professional context. Qualifying exams, if the students, if your students have to sit any international exams, for example, they will be required to read and understand the instructions or guidelines or manuals and so on and so forth. So online teaching and learning, how can you set up activities there? Put the activity on the screen. Ask a student to read the instructions or ask them all to read the instructions um, quietly and then ask for examples. Most of the things that you do in class, you can do online. Not everything, but you can. Now, the big sort of, I don't know what to call this, the big monster. Uh, teach talk, speaking time. Teacher speaking time versus learner speaking time. You tell me, I'm not going to tell you. You know what is involved here. Hello. Who, is, who speaks more in class? I do hope it's students, but it's students. That sounds great. They should, yes, absolutely. <laughs> but teachers do, <laughs> yes, students should. Yeah, okay especially if teachers uh, insist on doing what they have experienced through grammar translation, uh, there will be no time for the students to speak in class. I know, <laughs> so reality, yes. Um, I know that you're probably bored with this, but again, just very quickly, if you've got a 40 minute lesson, how long would the teacher take? It should be students, yes, we all agree. Uh, but how long would the, do you think the average teacher would speak in a 40 minute class? 70%? <laughs> okay, that's a lot, isn't it? And if you have 30 students? Okay. 15 minutes for 30 students, half a minute per student. If you don't do pair work and group work to multiply, to optimize that time, then each student, if or students are only answering, telling you, speaking with you, it's teacher student, then each student will speak half a minute per lesson. One minute depends on how many uh, classes you have. One two minutes per week, and so on and so forth. At any rate, at the end of the three uh, years, they'll have spoken maybe an hour, an hour and a half. It won't do. Yes, it should be mostly students. Now, for that reason, we need to find ways to get students to collaborate as much as possible. And again, uh, I'll can't repeat that enough. Please do tell you, your teachers to always think about whether students can do what they're about to do. The students can say what they're about to say, because if they can, they should let them say, find a way to get them to do it. Otherwise, they're really depriving their students of opportunities. Uh, the other thing to save time is to not echo. Um, if you're in class or online and you repeat everything every student says, do the rest of the students have any reason to listen to each other? Yeah? Yes, elicitations. No, no. Um, no, exactly. So don't echo. 
um, very nicely, not not sort of to to make them feel bad, but very nicely when someone says something. If you're online, uh, nominate another student and say, "Can you could you please repeat what was said, or could you hear?" And if they say, "Ah, oh, no, no, sorry, uh, okay, go back to the original speaker. Can you please repeat what you said?" Um, okay. Um, have you all heard that? Can we have one more person repeat it? But in this manner, um, not even if it's corrected, that as a matter of course, when people are saying things, when they're responding to things, when they're reporting ideas, always make sure someone else repeats that. It's like, uh, Ali, did you hear that? Uh, um, can you can you repeat what was said? Okay, to make sure to train your learners to listen to each other, because if you if you really time yourself, if every time a learner says something, you repeat an answer that was given, you'll find out that you've taken up a lot of time. If you want to repeat something because you're presenting, because it's it's something that's key. That's a different matter altogether. That's not what I'm talking about. So there are notes about that on, on your handout. Okay, every time a student says something, be it an answer, question, statement, etc., point to one or more students who are seated at a distance and ask them if they were able to hear, and so on and so forth. Exactly what I tried to uh, say. Yes, but all to get them, yeah, they repeat the information, but not because the information is so important, but instead of you echoing, you, you want them to become aware of the fact that they have to listen to each other. Because if they know that you're going to repeat every answer, they are not going to listen to each other. So we don't want that. We want the time in class to be constructive for all. Okay? Um, okay, so I'm afraid time is up. Um, thank, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Um, I know some of you have to leave, uh, so please, you're free to go. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Denai, for being so patient for it with us and the participants for all their valuable time in joining us today. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Ministry of Education and Tathweer uh, for their support with all these webinar series. So thank you so much. And our moderators who have been with us um, trying to deal with all the Q&As. We're just going to quickly go ahead to the session, the question answers that you have posted. So if you have to log off, please feel free to do that. Um, but we will just stay online for a, minute, for a few minutes uh, just to answer the questions because there are a, a couple of questions that have come along. And starting with the first one is, is making notes in their first language acceptable? Uh, only if they, for example, if they're brainstorming ideas and they haven't got the words, the language in English to express something, uh, allow them to jot it down in Arabic and give them the language they need afterwards. In other, that's, in other words, if they need help with the language to express something, and, but it's, it's valid as an idea, they could make a note of it in Arabic, but do provide the language they need to express in English. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean that every unit have all these items? Question mark. I mean, reading, conversation, pronunciation, etc. Yes, every unit has that. If you, if the teachers plan, which they should do, uh, look at the at the unit, look at the section, look at the teachers' uh, guide, and try to uh, 
uh, figure out the time they need because it's not the same thing all the way through. You know that some some uh, uh, material might take a bit longer. It depends on the learners as well and, and difficulties and challenges and so on. And having done that, they might feel that something is quite simple, um, not absolutely necessary, but that provided that they're not uh, doing grammar translation. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, is it easier and better to vary our teaching to meet all auditory and visual learners rather than testing them and disciplating our time in classifying them according to VAK learning style? That's fine. You can do whatever works. You can do whatever is necessary. It's good to know, um, have an idea of what the learning style is, and more so, I'm, I'm more quite honestly interested in, in, in how uh, multiple intelligences might affect students because there are all kinds of abilities beyond linguistic and mathematical um, that are considered talents. Our talents are very creative. Um, critical, so big discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the other one is how can we close the gap between low and high achieving students? You can't always close the gap, so this is why it's a good idea to focus on development uh, more than uh, one uniform outcome. So in other words, when you're looking at learning outcomes, be it, if you want to call them, your overall objectives and the goals that you have to reach those objectives, um, think of minimum and maximum. Uh, someone who is highly successful and someone who just manages, okay? Basically, if you have somebody who has a lot of problems, whom everything is a challenge and you find that two months into the course they can actually do things even if it's the minimum that person should be encouraged and rewarded How? in class collaborative learning by getting them to work together you use your uh, more advanced uh, more confident students as, if you like, tutor assistants. But you need to work in groups and pairs to do that. Yep. Okay. This one says, what are the most appropriate strategies for teaching reading skill in brackets comprehension? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't give you everything because there's no time. But basically, uh, we have talked about it Try, and, uh, try and, and, and follow a three-stage approach whereby initially the, the leading stage, what is called the warm-up sometimes, is not simply a warm-up. It creates the basis uh, of information and language that your learners will um, use to support them so they can read. So when we ask them to look look at the pictures and talk about a particular subject and think of possible words that they might find in, in their reading, what kind of information they might be able to find in the reading to predict. We don't want them to predict exactly what's in the text. We just want them to activate what they know, both in terms of general knowledge, specific knowledge and language. Okay, um, how to find teachers, yes. sorry, how to help teachers find weakness treatment plan in online teaching? Sorry, I didn't follow that. How to help teachers find weakness treatment plan in online teaching? I don't understand weakness treatment plan. Anything that we do in class applies to online um, work as well. Um, so basically, I mean, I would uh, repeat the same thing. It's, it's um, look at development. 
look at development, uh, encourage students to work together. Uh, if they're working online, assign homework for them to do in pairs online so they can help each other. Because otherwise, you'll have to do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. And then how can teachers improve the basic English skills for secondary students? I'm sorry, this is what we've been talking about. I, I, I can't answer that question in the time available. It's, it's, it's a, you're asking a question that uh, requires a, a whole kind of methodology to be answered. We have discussed different aspects of it. And the last one is, how can we reduce the teacher talking time and increase more conversational English with the students? Well, we've just discussed that as well. By setting up activities carefully so that everybody knows what to do and getting learners to do things in pairs and groups so we can optimize the time. And by not translating and traditionally explaining and, and, and uh, giving rules, but helping learners discover the rules. And then, okay, they can read it. You can give it to them to confirm whatever. Mm -hmm. All right, and we come towards the end now. So thank you so much for joining us for this secondary um, supervisor training that we did today in the morning at 10 and 1. And we hope to see you soon. We hope this was useful. Um, stay in touch with us. And uh, thank you so much. See you next time. Can I can I just say something very quickly? Yes, of course. So, yeah, uh, there's going to be a cycle two. Uh, what uh, I'm going to try and do is take into consideration um, some of the key questions and comments and so on that you've made, and hopefully, you know, that's going to um, maybe help a little more. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Um, you will receive the certificate after the sessions are over. So this is going to come around after November 19th. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye.